Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful. Kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. Father, you instruct the hearts of your faithful people by the light of the Holy Spirit. Grant us in that same spirit to savor what is right, and always to rejoice in his consolation. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, thank you for all, all for coming today. Uh, the book that we're discussing during this Lenten season is Creation and the Cross. I won't embarrass you by asking how many of you bought the book, but I, but I did recommend that you do so, since we're going to be following 30 pages a week in this, and it's the kind of book you want to read and reread and keep on your shelf and have as you know, a continual reference. And, uh, the Mercy of God for a Planet in Peril is the subtitle. Uh, so it does, it's very ecological, as you've probably discovered already. That comes especially in the later sections, although she mentions it already uh, in the sections we read today. Uh, just noticing that uh, this uh, stained glass from Illinois, as it explains on the jacket, uh, are the four elements. You know, you can see fire, earth, the greenery of the earth, uh, dark and light blue for air and water. Uh, so it is very much oriented to a cosmic type of spirituality that I've discussed, of course, in my courses as well, the cosmic Christ, the deep incarnation, as we saw last Advent, which you'll also talk about later in this book. So just a few minutes on the introduction. By the way, I'll be going through this kind of page by page, so if you want to follow along, and if you noted anything in your previous reading that you wanted to bring up or comment on or ask about, and I don't comment on it as I go by, please just you know raise your hand and, and talk about it as we are on that page, all right? Um, so the introduction, you know, uh, she uh, speaks about the fact that, many don't realize this, despite the fact that, you know, St. Paul and others, you know, say Christ died for our sins, that's why I put a question mark on it in my blurb for the bulletin and for the, uh, online. Uh, there are all sorts of theories about exactly how, how he did that, why he did that, and how that works. Uh, in the, pre in the first centuries, very often, and you see this in some of the hymns, for example, that we used in the monastery during Passion Tide and Easter Tide, uh, we were paying a ransom. And Jesus himself said he, I, in Mark's Gospel, the Son of Man came to give his life as a ransom for many. Well, who's the ransom to? Is it God? I mean, some, some even said he was paying a ransom to the devil, because the devil owned us now after the fall. So the devil had to have a ransom paid. Uh, one of the hymns that we use uh, during Easter week, the main hymn we use during Easter week, uh, is in the monastery, is that, you know, death had a hook there, and it caught Jesus as, as the uh, catch, but really it only caught itself because Jesus didn't need to die because he was God and sinless. So uh, the only one who perished was death itself. Very interesting idea that the death or the devil got caught by in its own trap. By killing Christ who didn't need to die, death was overcome. Really interesting idea. Uh, but here, in the 11th century, we get uh, Anselm's uh, discourse, uh, which, uh, as you see, as you will see, you know, uh, became, uh, as he says, you know, I sometimes think Anselm may well be the most successful theologian of all time. Because this particular theory, even unconsciously for people in the way I was taught, certainly, so overwhelmed and, uh, what would you say, formed or deformed our psyches that uh, we have to, think, to even question, to question it sounds like we're questioning the faith itself. But on that same page, she quotes Joseph Ratzinger, future Pope Benedict, uh, who was a critic of the treatise, actually, and said, you know, it, it, it put it a decisive stamp on the second millennium of Western Christianity, he says, which takes it for granted that Christ had to die on the cross in order to make good the infinite offense that had been committed and in this way to restore the order that had been violated. And that's the essence of Anselm's argument, as, as we're going to see. But in the East, for example, as she says, you know, the, the incarnation is redemptive of all creation, the resurrection overcomes sin and death, there's much more emphasis on the resurrection. Uh, 
Dominic Croissant, Benedict Croissant, the, the, uh, the uh, scripture scholar, uh, just told him, wrote a whole book on the resurrection, on how, uh, on how we lost in the West what the East kept, uh, this sense of the resurrection, including all of creation, and not just, uh, as Richard Rohr says, a touchdown dance of the Jesus himself. I'm, 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 I'm risen, so worship me. Um, it's, it's, it's a whole cosmic thing. But we'll get to, we'll get to that in due course. So she, she says she's going to use the structure of, of the discourse itself, which is a dialogue. So she, instead of a, a monk, and Anselm was a Benedictine, he became abbot of Pecanois in Normandy, and then later as Archbishop of Canterbury, so he had quite a career. Uh, he died in his 70s. Um, but it's, so she, Elizabeth, takes Clara, a mythical, kind of a, a compendium of all her <coughs> students uh, over the years, who, you know, which whose name is Light or Clarity, Clara. Uh, uh, as her interlocutor, so it's an interesting uh, presentation of the material. She says it's not a complete or definitive work, it's just a contribution to it. So, wrestling with Anselm in chapter one, uh, faith seeking understanding, fides querens intellectum, is oddly enough, or, 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 or you know, providentially enough, a phrase of Anselm. That probably his most famous phrase that it entered into our theological spiritual vocabulary, faith seeking understanding. So that's what we're doing, that's what he was doing, as we always try to do more or less successfully, uh, to uh, seek understanding of what our faith says. So Christ died for our sins, what does that mean in this case? Hmm? So, uh, he, as she says, it, it, the Anselm's whole approach takes for granted uh, that it was that, that Jesus' death was necessary. The only unknown being why. But as you see, we're going to question that assumption itself. Anyway, uh, uh, the need for restitution, uh, Christ's sinlessness, it's all about a particular society. Now, the whole section on feudalism is fascinating. He lived in a feudal society where the, the, the Lord of the manor, God, the Lord of the cosmos, um, it keeps order, you know, in a society that could go barbaric, and therefore he has to be paid a certain amount of honor. And if you offend the lord of the manor, uh, you're actually offending, you know, the whole s s order of society, and you need to, to make up for it and give satisfaction to the offended honor of the uh, lord of the manor. So, and so, Anselm applies this to the whole universe, to God, to God, and you know, in the small universe in which he lived. And this is one of her points as she goes on, main points. You know, where the Earth was the only planet. Well, I mean, the only inhabited planet. There were some spheres of planets up there. You know, in our certainly the only solar system. Uh, and of course, the Earth was the center, and the Sun went around. So everything was centered on the Earth, and hell was underneath the Earth. Heaven was literally up there, just beyond the stratosphere, what we call the stratosphere today. And of course, we know all that is pure nonsense. But it was easy to see this whole thing as one big feudal man. It was small enough, and the order was clear enough and fragile enough that you know we really had to take uh, special care of it uh, to make restoration uh, in a way that's, that's satisfactory to the person uh, who was offended. So, it, what it comes down to, as Clara says, uh, is that none but God can make a satisfaction that's, that is at the level of God and the Master's honor. So, only God can give to God a satisfaction that is at his level. And yet only man, only humans, need to do it because we're the ones that offended God. So how do you resolve that? I was just taken by the fact that she said that <coughs> he built the answer into the way he set up the question. Right, because if you set up the question by saying, well, God is the Lord of a manner that needs to have his honor recompensed or satisfaction made and order restored, well, then you, you basically set up already that they determine, they determine the way the answer is going to be given. So the way the question is asked 
is already setting up how the, how the answer is going to be given. That's true of everything, I guess. I was going to say, like in science, you know, they say, if you have an idea of what the end product is, the way you set up your experiments, so it's just for ourselves, I think for myself, um, you know, how one has to be so much more open to understand things. Yeah, especially in Alice, she, she goes on to say that we don't have that worldview anymore, and how adequate is it to, our, to a vision of God that we have today, or that we always should have had. Uh, because, you know, as she, as she points out, you know, uh, uh, in, in this chapter, you know, making satisfaction, you know, for this offense committed is not at all what you get out of the gospel. You know, the prodigal son, you know, as she says very well, it's as if the father said, okay, I welcome you back and I throw this party for you, but now you've got to work off, you've got to work for, you know, 15 years to make satisfaction for your offense. I mean, that's just not the gospel. It might be feudal society, and God imagined as a feudal lord, but God is not a feudal lord. So what happened to the gospel? Culture always seems to trump the gospel. Sorry, sorry to use that word. But, you know. <laughs> it does. Culture does trump the gospel, as we're seeing. So, uh, but, but that's the nub of it. If none but God can make satisfaction, but none but human beings ought to. That's a quote from Anselm. Then what's the solution? Ah, the perfect solution is to have a God-man. Jesus, who is God, can make an adequate satisfaction, but Jesus as man can make the necessary satisfaction. And as she points out, this is a wonderful solution of God's mercy. If we take for granted that satisfaction has to be made, and God is a feudal Lord, and you have, this is the order that has to be restored, if you accept the premise, well then, that God would arrange it this way, find a perfect solution so that both the divine and the human poles are respected, this is a tremendous act of mercy on God's part. What a wonderful, merciful solution that God found. And it is, it's brilliant, within the context of the premises. <laughs> but, we'll, she's going to go on to explain what, how harmful those premises are, so yes. That confuses me because Jesus is God, how does God Well, because it's the Son of God, because there's a trinity. So, so in a sense, God is giving satisfaction to himself, but it's nonetheless through, through the person of his Son. Uh, so, yeah, so that's, that's how it can work. You know. uh, always presuming that the, that the honor does have to be repaid in the divine way. Hmm? Uh, so how blessed be God, you know, that it works this way. Uh, and the, the Jesus did not owe, Jesus himself did not owe this satisfaction. He gave that extra little bit of satisfaction by dying. So the dying was, was the thing. And then Clara points out, well, the trouble with this is that we know today that death is not just something that came as a result of sin, uh, that, that uh, had to be repaid, you know, uh, a penalty for sin, which is the way it was understood. Last year, when I gave my course on eschatology during Lent, I spent a whole day on death. You can see it, catch it online, which I explained that death is not a penalty for sin. Death is built into the universe. It's part of life. And that's what she points out here. Death existed in the world of biological life millions of years before human beings emerged. Death is an intrinsic part of the evolutionary process of life, which should make us feel a lot better about death. But it's just part of the flow of things. Don't be so afraid of it. You know. If you're born, you die. If you can do the one, you can do the other. Sin or no sin, there is death on this planet. Mm -hmm. So that's important to realize mm? uh, in, in this whole debate. Mm? So, so it's it in, indeed beautiful in its own context, as Clara says. Within the constraints he has set up, she says, Anselm shows that God's mercy is greater than we could ever have imagined, which is true. So once you accept the premises, it actually is very impressive. Which I guess explains why it was so successful, theologically and spiritually. At the very end of, the, uh, of the, that section, uh, she says, that, that I found this very telling and very uh, almost moving. She says, when I read this treatise with students in graduate courses, almost everyone is intellectually and even existentially moved by the power of the argument about divine mercy. We get swept away by the logic and end up almost speechless before the magnitude of divine goodness. 
problem, of course, is the assumption, flawed at the outset, that God's offended honor needs to be recompensed with some kind of satisfaction. That's the fundamental error. That God's offended honor needs to be recompensed with some kind of satisfaction. That might appear necessary in feudal society and in other societies too. You know, one of the marks of maturity, spiritual and psychological maturity, Richard Rohr has pointed this out, is that, and you can measure yourself against this, if you're really mature psychologically and spiritually, you cannot be offended or uh, flattered. So, if God is God, God can't be offended or flattered either. So this whole notion of somebody who's offended, and all the connotations of that, emotional connotations of that, is very, very dangerous and very destructive, because we're not dealing with that at all. And then she has a brief section on the satisfaction of theory through history, and I was reflecting on this as I read it the second time even more, and, and uh, she points out in just a few sentences how, how this influenced the theology and spirituality on and into the, you know, the Council of Trent and beyond. It became entwined with individual sacramental confession, with penance set by the priest, for which the logic of the satisfaction theory gave intelligent justification. So the whole thing about doing a penance because to make satisfaction tied to this. That's why you know, I always try and make it something like, you know, how can you uh, reinforce the virtues that you, you need, you know, how can you do, a good, do good in the world as a penance, so to speak, instead of just making satisfaction for something you did. Say three Hail Marys, or, or say the rosary because you were, you were, you were naughty. Come on. No. Promoting a heavily sinful view of the world, the theory also helped grow a public penitential system whereby indulgences could be applied, satisfaction, and then the Protestant, you know, all of that that came out of that which also, to pay off the debt in purgatory, and the institutional church's juridical power is enhanced, not accidentally, by all of this. Uh, new patterns of spirituality that focused on the cross. Inspiring profound personal devotion to the crucified Jesus. He died for my sins, I owe him my love. Okay, yeah, it can be, can be beautiful if you want to share in Christ's suffering, and he did this for you, but, um, uh, it's better to see it as he's sharing in your suffering, not you're sharing in his, you know, because that's what he actually came to do. And we'll develop that more idea, that idea more as we go on. Then the teaching on the mass is a sacrifice that made present once again Christ's atoning death on the cross for sins of the world, and liturgical prayers which are composed in function of that, sacramental theology of the Eucharist, you know, of offering Mass, a satisfaction, you know, an atonement, you know, every time the sacrifice, so the holy sacrifice of the Mass, which is what you hear conservatives always calling the Eucharist, the holy sacrifice of the Mass. It, it, of course, it's, there's a truth there that can be understood in a very, very beneficial way, but it can also be understood in a kind of unbalanced way, uh, along the lines of, of this particular theology. Mm -hmm. And then, as she points out very well at the end of this short section, punishment. The Protestants especially, in the 16th century and onwards, developed, developed the, the atonement theory of satisfaction into a penal substitution theory that goes even beyond Anselm, where Christ underwent the punishment for our sins. It was, he was being punished, not just making satisfaction in the feudal way, but he was being punished. And so he's being punished instead of us, who deserve to be punished. This doesn't get much past the parental relationship. You deserve to be punished. Stand in the corner. Very, very primitive and, and dangerous stuff. Mm -hmm. And it just wrought, has wrought havoc on the psychology and the spirituality of, of Christian people over these centuries. Who knows what kind of wars and you know, the dysfunction it's caused in families and you know, between nations and punishment, satisfaction, sin, all over the place. Very, very unhealthy and unbalanced, as anything unhealthy is, is unbalanced, whether in the body or in the mind or in the soul. Uh, so, uh, he says, she says, truth be told, the shadow it cast almost eclipsed other elements of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And by the way, she, she quotes people already in the beginning, like, uh, like Abelard and 
uh, some of the theologians that they reacted against it right away. Uh, the, uh, for example, even Thomas Aquinas said, you know, you, you can't, you can't say that uh, that uh, that Christ's death was necessary. You can say it was fitting, but you can't say it's necessary. So even Thomas Aquinas, back in the day, reacted, you know, somewhat against this particular view, and other theologians did too. As we saw, even Joseph Ratzinger had some, you know, qualifying things to say about it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's right here at the beginning of the section with Thomas Aquinas and Abelard. Dun Scotus also the great Franciscan theologian that I quoted in previous confer conferences. So this is the main part, though, of, of this particular section, which I think deserves huge, you know, un, uh, unstinting meditation on your part, where she goes through the seven, at least seven, nefarious consequences, extremely harmful consequences of this theory. Whatever its value might have been in the time, in its own cultural context, uh, as we just saw, uh, doing dialogue, in, with doing theology and dialogue with your culture, as she says at the beginning here, it, it certainly does not work anymore and is very dangerous in itself. Hmm? Uh, so there is uh, the first criticism. Clara says, the scales today tip more heavily toward the pr problematic side of this theory, don't they? Yes, they do. So the first criticism, it presents a disastrous image of God. God is someone who's up there offended and needs to have his honor restored and satisfaction made for us not evil humans. So he's going to require the, require the bloody sacrifice of his own son in order to make fitting satisfaction for the... This is sadistic horror. This is the stuff of nightmares. This is not God. Who would love such a God as this, as she says? Uh, so she says it's a disastrous image of God. It's mar God is morally repulsive here. It's problematic in every possible way. It's vindictive, sadistic, you know. Uh, God should consider the death of his son so agreeable, you know. The awful idea of a sophistic, sadistic God concerned with his own honor who becomes offended by sin and whose anger needs to be placated by the precious blood of his son. Now, I, I challenge all of you to go down deep into your psyches and your spiritual formation and tell me you don't encounter that there. I dare you to say you don't encounter that kind of God there. But that's what you were given. And that's what you're afraid of. Hmm? It's a lie. It's a lie. All you've got to do is actually go to the gospel and see who God is in order to overcome that. But when sister tells you in school and the priests tell you in church and your mommy and daddy tell you at home that this is who God is, you're going to believe them and your five-year-old psyche is going to be scarred for life by this image of God. No wonder there's so many atheists who've given up Christianity. I think they're just searching for the real God. All right, so that's the worst, uh, first, and most important uh, problem with this theory is this, 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 uh, this sinister God, as she's called, she's called it. Mm -hmm. um. Secondly, it completely omits the resurrection. So the resurrection goes missing. Just two weeks ago or three weeks ago, we had in the Sunday Gospel of Paul, 1 Corinthians 15, talking about if Christ is not raised, neither, if, if you're not raised from the dead, then neither was Christ raised from the dead. And some people say, well, wait a minute. If it's just a touchdown dance by the resurrected Jesus, why do we have to be resurrected too? You know, how can you say Christ wasn't raised if we're not raised? And Paul says, well, because it's all one. If he was raised, so were we, because we share the humanity. Right? We're connected to Christ. So if he wasn't raised, we weren't either. Um, and as we, as we pointed out, you know, in the East, they've cut, cut, the, the resurrection is always depicted never as Jesus alone, but as Jesus going down into Hades and rescuing Adam and Eve from, from, from the netherworld, right? It's always a group. That's what Dominic Crossland's book points out as well. And, you know, I just learned... Richard Rohr pointed this out in a, in, a, in, a, in a video. We know that the crucifixion wasn't pictured during the Roman Empire at times because it was too shocking depicted, but neither, the resurrection wasn't depicted for six centuries. 
And I realized, wow, that's true. Hmm. You had images of the Good Shepherd and all this, but you didn't have any images of the resurrection. And that's another reason why, because it's, how can you picture that? Can you picture the whole universe being resurrected? Because it wasn't just Jesus. Very interesting. So we lost something by trying to depict this, this unindividual rising, you know, as if that was the main point, or the only point, or the only reality of it. So the resurrection goes missing, and we're focused always on the suffering and the cross. <coughs> Very much in the, in the West. Uh, is that true? Third, the ministry goes missing. You know, I pointed out, you know, in the, in the Creed, in the Apostles' Creed, we say he uh, suffered under Pontius Pilate, he, he was born of the Virgin Mary, and suffered under Pontius Pilate. What happened in between? What happened to all that? No wonder we haven't followed Jesus' teaching on the Beatitudes, love your enemies, and all this stuff, because we haven't even bothered to read the Gospel. We just say he was born of the Virgin and he died for our sins, as if he only came to die. And if he only came to die, then what did we come for? To die? Is that it? So, you know, living got lost. His, all, his life and his teaching got lost. Uh, his coming of the reign of God, uh, all his, you know... Uh, and then he suffered, as she says, for the way he loved God and neighbor, not because he needed to pay a debt to divine honor. So the crucifixion was not willed by God in that sense. It was, unfortunately, the consequence of someone of his caliber coming in to preach justice and love in the world and the, and the priestly and political establishment not, not being able to take it. And how many prophets in our own time, look at the assassinations, have died, died in the same way, for the same reason. They were a threat to the established order. So, whereas in the feudal times you were trying to keep the order, a real prophet tries to overturn the order and establish what Jesus did call the kingdom of God. You know, which is way beyond any human or even religious kingdom, which is why they don't like to hear it. So if Jesus redeemed the world and saved us from our sins, it was by being faithful to his mission even to the point of death. Not because he came to die in order to satisfy the honor of an angry God. You can't tell yourself this enough times change, you know, decades of, of deformation, both uh, group and, and individual. So, and then after I do this fourth one, we'll get a few reactions and questions if you have any. A significant fourth criticism is Ansel, in Amsilm's theory is, it sacralizes violence. It sacralizes violence. Have you ever thought of that? That if it was okay for God to exact a bloody violent death for his own son, well, then why can't we exercise violence for some apparently good end? You know, if God is violent, why can't we be? And of course you have, you know, the Hebrew scriptures where they're going in and they're slaughtering every, every animal, woman, man, woman, and child, you know, to take over the Holy Land, and it's, it's, it's right there. But this only adds to it and certifies it puts the steel of approval on it. And so no wonder we were slaughtering each other all through the centuries, Christian nations in all the World War I, World War II, all these, because there was no teaching of the Beatitudes, we forgot his life and his teaching, and all we have is his death, which God needed, the violent death, so let's do the same for a good end ourselves. Politically, this translates into a blessing on the use of force, specifically the use of aggressive force by powerful people, and of course, because later speaks of the conquistadores and all this stuff in our own century was where violence seems to be sanctioned by God, you know, in the name of God. Why not? You know, if God is violent himself, you know, uh, then of course, why not? Mm -hmm. Any comments or questions before we continue? Yes, go. Uh, I don't believe this. I was struck by, uh, you know, and some proposal theory, although there were objections to it seemed like the image was a, a, it was a feeling of gratitude for this overwhelming mercy of God. Well, that's, that's what I said, yeah. How did that get distorted into this sadistic God who was like um, exactly his pound of flesh? Because you don't have to go very far from there to get there. 
It's, it only made sense within the feudal vision of God, which was false to start with. Okay. So, you know, if, if, if God, you know, arranged you know, for this violent death to satisfy his honor, well, once you're out of the feudal system, it makes even less sense, but it's still the same image. You know? So as she's, as she's saying, the premises are false. It's not a good model, the feudal um, model. I agree with that. I'm just, it just seemed like such a contrast to go from this wonderfully merciful God who came up with a solution for humankind to this God who's, who's sadistic and angry and violent. Yeah, I guess it's, it's not it's not a it's not a it's not a it's not a, a, a stretch, is it? Given the human psychology. Okay, thank you. Yes. So basically, the church has concretized ideas from cultural and culture and society, tribal religion from two thousand maybe beyond, cult, uh, codified it, made it a religion, and hasn't changed these doctrines for 2,000 years to meet what the awareness we have now. Well, I mean, that's putting it a little starkly, uh, but, but, but it, it's true that we had, at her point in the book, the reason she wrote the book is to say we need now to adapt to a whole new vision of the universe and take a whole new look at the gospel in function of that, and anyway, and then put that together when we come up with them, that's the rest of the book. So, so Jesus appears and they interpret him based on their beliefs and what they, how they interpret him. Well, of course. Even the Gospels do that. I mean, he may have been, maybe he was an average person who had life-transforming love and, and, and had deep mystical transformation, but they didn't have the language to, to uh, speak about this, and they only had the language of Judaism and tribal religion or whatever it was to, to interpret him. Yeah, well, I wouldn't just say he's an average person. No, I'm not, saying, saying, that. I'm not saying that. Not the, you know what I'm saying. Something happens in reality. What you're saying is that there's always an interpretation. Something broke through in evolutionary consciousness. There's always an interpretation, and the interpretation is always limited. That's why, you have to, that's why as I always say, you need contemplation. You need silent prayer. You need to go down into depths beyond language and culture and image and your own self and your own, your own uh, you know, prejudices and presuppositions and formation. Because that's all. That's the. Only, that's the way you're going to re meet the real God. Otherwise, you're going to think that your particular culture. Talk about America. You're going to think your your own your particular culture is the culture, the way. And even Christianity is saying we're the way. And when they mean Christianity, they don't mean Christ. They mean our cultural version of Christianity. Uh, and we have to get beyond that. And this is a good. This is a good. You know. Uh, uh, it's a good starting point because it's so obvious that it needs to be faced and changed, that we need to, to look at it, you know, again. Uh, yes? In this tape on the Amazonian view, how do you view the uh, Christ's prayer and the uh, Garden of Gethsemane? Do you think it's kind of weird? Well, how would you think? We just saw it. We just saw it. It says, he suffered for the way he loved God and neighbor, not because he needed to pay a debt to the divine honor. So, in that sense, God's will, if you want, was here I am and I'm being faithful and I'm going to have to go through it. This is, I'm going to take the consequence of human injustice, absorb it, transform it, and rise from the dead. He's not saying, well, I know, Father, you want me to die because I have to do, you know, you know, satisfy your honor. All right. That's not the right way, but that's the way it's been read. Right? It's simply, your will be done is simply another way of saying, I'm going to take the consequences of the way I live you know, for the sake of the kingdom of God, mm -hmm. without anger and hatred and vengeance, the way most other people, all other people would. Mm -hmm. All right, let's, uh, let's go on, and then we can have some more, a little more discussion at the end. Fifth negative consequence, morbid spirituality, boy, especially in the West, right? You know flogging and the carrying the cross and all these Holy Week processions and all this stuff, you know, which I suppose you can live in a, in, a, in, a, in a healthier way. But, you know, the whole thing is that Jesus, said Jesus came to die and, you know, we're, we're, everything is, we're so sin-obsessed, guilt, uh, life on earth is a valley of tears, people accept that suffering is divinely willed. We're going to see the consequence of that in a second. And a mystical, even masochistic dolorism Masochistic dolorism colored the following of Christ. You know, instead of the joy of the resurrection, instead of the joy of life, instead of living, you know, according to the Beatitudes and transforming society, 
uh, and enjoying our bodiliness as Jesus came to share in our bodiliness, all of these things became rather sources of guilt and suffering. The life, life is a veil of tears. Because if all you concentrate on is Christ's suffering, well, of course it's a veil of tears. But that wasn't all of Christ, and it's certainly not all of Christ now. And then, of course, it gets connected with obedience, you know, as we just were saying, uh, understood not so well. So and as a consequence of this, the sixth criticism, there's an ethic of submission in the face of injustice. Christ submitted to his Father, who wanted his death. And he was obedient unto death. So you should be obedient in your sufferings, no matter what they are. Submit. All you slaves, you oppressed housewives, you conquered peoples, all of you poor, submit to the suffering, you know, as Jesus did, you know, in obedience to the powers that be. You know. Very easy to go there. And we did, of course. You know. Submission in the face of injustice. Hmm? People were encouraged to suffer and endure injustice without resistance rather than challenging existing wrongful circumstances. Both Catholic and Reformation traditions have walked down this path. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's very serious. Hmm? Uh, you know, and she speaks a whole page here on African Americans and slavery, and Jim Crow, uh, and all of that, how that was often used. Um, and she quotes uh, James Cone as saying, you know, we need to see the uh, crucifixion as a first century lynching. Really, that's what it was. Mm -hmm. I mean, it goes through the courts, but that doesn't mean anything often enough, as we know. Mm -hmm. uh, redemption can have... Uh, redemption can have nothing to do with any kind of surrogate or substitute role Jesus was reputed to have played in a bloody act. So, uh, and then, then she mentions the conquistadores, indigenous peoples, the millions of people, poor people suffering from systems, systemic economic injustice, contemporary liberation theology, all of this is, you know, a, a new way to approach all this. Oh, then women, as I just said, uh, who were encouraged, you know, to be obedient there's a whole current there. It's not just the atonement theory. It's the whole submission of women in, you know, in St. Paul and others you know, in, in the culture of Judaism and Islam, as well as Christian Catholicism many times. You know, you're supposed to be subservient and silent and secondary and the helpmate and all of this BS, you know, uh, which you know, needs to be reexamined now today, thankfully. You know. uh, but this could all be used to, 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 to buttress that kind of system. Passive submission to victimization as a virtue. Because that's what Christ you know, underwent. Hmm? Uh, but then she does say, you know, Latin American peoples, and especially, you know, the, the spirituals, the, the, you know, of, of the of slave, slave, enslaved peoples, that is in a sense of, sh of sh recognizing that Jesus is with us, you know, in our suffering, and that we're with Jesus in our suffering. That, that, that you know, that's valid. Um, that they sense, they sense God's presence, Christ's presence to them in their suffering uh, as a consolation. And finally, the seventh criticism is highly relevant today, the ecological silence maintained by Ads Anselm. You know, the natural world, as she says, is merely a stage on which the important drama of human salvation is played out. Well, Richard Rohr, in his new book, The Universal Christ, makes a lot of this point, too. Um, <laughs> you know, the notion that, now, as we know now, Billions of years, you know, went by since the Big Bang, and you know, 4.5 billion years on this planet, with hundreds of millions of years of Tyrannosaurus Rex, which now has a big exhibition at the National Museum, uh, History Museum. And what was God doing during all that time? Waiting. <coughs> nothing useful. Nothing important is going to happen until we finally get human beings here. So, come on, Tyrannosaurus, how many millions of years? You know, you know. God was enjoying this. He was creating, he was exalting it. This was already a share, you know, in his life, already a manifestation of his love. You know. uh, and it still is, you know. And we are, you know, are in integrated into, not just at the top of the food chain, but we're integrated into this vast system, you know, of all the four elements and, and the animals and the flowers and all that, this whole ecological movement that Pope Francis has rightly put at the top of the agenda for our planet now, Planet in Peril, the subtitle. Um, 
You have to have a stronger sense of this, the cosmic you know, suffering, and she'll get more into that, and the cosmic resurrection, the, the cosmic kingdom of God, the cosmic dimensions of God's plan for us, and the fact that the Trinity and Christ, I mean, are present in the whole thing, deeply present in the whole thing. You know. uh, so we need to recover that, and that's what uh, much of her book is going to be uh, as it goes forward. Uh, so, and the last section, you know, she, she quotes a, as she does in her book on Darwin and the God of Love. And she quotes this example there too of John Ruhr, uh, the American naturalist who was, uh, who was you know, in the, in the West and comes across a dead bear. Uh, and he says, you mean this magnificent creature is inconsequential to God? The life and the death and the future of this bear is of no consequence? And he says, God's charity is broad enough for bears. And she says, she, she believes she's, he's right in that. So human beings are included as part of the whole community of creation, as she says. Mm -hmm. So whatever theory we come up with, and however we explain this whole drama of God's involvement in the world in Christ, it has to include the whole universe. It, has to, it certainly has to include the whole planet. You know. uh, otherwise, it's not going to be adequate to our, to our understanding of the world dialogue of culture, as Anselm was in his time. The presence of the wide, evolving cosmos calls for a genuinely new paradigm, different from the anthropocentric concern with human sin in the context of feudal obligations. We need to turn the page on the satisfaction theory and allow it to take a well-deserved rest. So we need people to say loud and clear, as she is doing, that this is not helpful if it ever was, you can make an argument that it was at some point, but certainly not now. And especially over the past hundreds of years where it has exercised an absolutely deleterious and nefarious effect on the human psyche and spirituality and theology and, so, and politics and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to be very lucid about this. So we have to go down and search into our souls and see where is this still lurking in me? What formation have I received that that this is still lurking down in my psyche somewhere, in my soul and in my body, in my emotions and in my understanding and my concepts. And with the help of a few good therapists and spiritual directors, root it out and replace it with something truer and better that's more faithful to the gospel itself, clearly, and also more faithful to our understanding of the world and of God that we've come to after all these 2,000 years of Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what she's going to be starting to do in book two, which we'll see next week. Mm -hmm. So the, I, I wanted to point out that the, the one line that, uh, that most stayed with me when my first reading of this whole first section was when Clara says, each of these critiques on its own is compelling. In other words, any single one of those seven would be overwhelmingly convincing and, and critical and cogent and, and uh, you know, really necessary to move on, uh, uh, urgent. Mm -hmm. But taken together, they are staggering. That is not too strong a word. They are staggering when you realize the effect this has had on the past thousand years of Christianity. Staggering. That's how important it is that we remedy this and become aware of it. Mm -hmm. And then these sentences that are just below it, and this will shock you, especially if you haven't heard what we've just been going through, but you need to repeat this to yourself you know, over the next, the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. The mercy of God does not need the death of Jesus. I repeat, the mercy of God does not need the death of Jesus. Second, satisfaction is not due before sin can be forgiven. Satisfaction is not due before sin can be forgiven. And this most of all, the death of Jesus is not necessary for salvation. I mean, that probably shocks you to death, right? The death of Jesus is not necessary for salvation. But wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, okay, wait a minute. 
study, pray, absorb, see how that is necessarily true. The death of Jesus is not necessary for salvation. And if you're too, too afraid to embrace that, let me just remind you, as she did earlier, that's what St. Thomas Aquinas, the greatest theologian that the church has upheld in the last thousand years, that's exactly, exactly what he says. The death of Jesus is not necessary. It's fitting. And you can argue about that, how it's fitting and how it works. Because the death of Jesus is involved in our salvation, but how? Well, we'll see. Mm -hmm. But it's not necessary, especially not in the terms that he's presented it. And so, mm -hmm. so you can just appeal to St. Thomas if anybody questions you on that. The death of Jesus is not necessary for salvation. It's a complete overturn of the last thousand years. So don't you think that's pretty, pretty amazing and pretty consequential? Pretty important? This overturns popular theology of the last thousand years. Nothing short of that. Was it not a popular theory until the first thousand years? No, no, I, I was explaining in the very beginning. This was not a theory until, not, not in these terms, uh, that, that, that became so harmful, the feudal society. It wasn't a feudal society. Said it was about ransom, paying ransom to the devil, or so, just Christ died somehow in obedience to the Father, but, but not with this, this kind of elaboration that became was cultural at the time. Mm -hmm. So that's why I said in my blurb for the course, this will change your life. I mean, it absolutely will, if you take it seriously. It will change your life. Well, you heard what you said about the Mass, that, they, that you can have, you can have a, an Anselmic slant on your understanding of the Mass, which I think is harmful, not helpful. Yeah. You know. But, you know, often a Mass is a sacrifice, a Mass of Christ offering himself to the Father, and we are offering ourselves to the Father in our life and our death. I mean, that, that, that's fine, that's fine. Uh, but you have to understand it correctly. You know, who, who is this God, and who am I, and what is the sacrifice, and how does it work, instead of instead of uh, what we've often been taught. You know. well, we don't, he did take away the sins, but how? 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 That's, the, that's just what she said in the beginning. It's, it's, it's the question. It's, it's the how of it. You know. He did take away the sins of the world, but not by placating an angry God with his satisfaction. You know. It's by being faithful to his mission in a way that did not involve anger and vengeance. That's how he took away the sins of the world, and how he continues to do so. Uh, I grew up as not a Christian, and so this whole idea of Jesus' death is needed for salvation is just, I never ever thought of that, because Jesus had no part in my upbringing, and I, I really didn't think or that you do need salvation anyway. <laughs> well, so, yeah, you grew up Jewish, right? So just yeah, people so this, you said it's going to change your life, but it's... Well, that's because you were cradle Catholic. Okay, I agree. Yeah. It, for people who aren't cradle Catholic, congratulations. Yeah. You don't have to go through quite the same, you know, <laughs> topsy-turvy <laughs> stuff. But, but on the other hand, you know, if... if and, uh, this is not directed to you personally, but if, if you know, if, 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 if you take, take, you know, the Exodus and the narratives and the destruction, yeah. you know, the Book of Judges and all that, well... Yeah. You're kind of close to this, as I said earlier, kind of close to this notion of God as being a violent God. You know. yeah, anyone else? Uh, yes. Well, just, uh, this is a little, it's an example or just to the sixth criticism regarding um, Injustice. people and slaves. Um, sort of and to the point of re-examining things, there was, from a secular point of view, David Brooks wrote an article, a column yesterday in the Times, yeah. about reparation. I saw that. Yeah. And it was a, And I like the point he made about, you know, it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't mean handing out money. Right. Same thing with the abuse crisis in the church, by the way. It's not just about handing out money. It's about having a real change or change of heart and really embracing the suffering of the victims, you know, in, in a way that's, that's effective, you know, that, that means something, yes. And it would, it would involve overturning the um, women's role in the, in of the course. church. Of course. I mean, that seems to be right up there. You know, we'll see how that goes, and it does need to be theologically considered, as well as they're doing now already with, with the diaconate, but uh, 
it's a whole it's a whole transformation of the clerical culture and the whole business that the boys club you know which we know is is rightfully under attack now from all from many from many quarters yes um, given that this is um, potentially very uh, disruptive to traditional thinking has, has there been any um, sort of training of the big guns of the theological establishment onto Elizabeth Johnson to try to refute it well not this particular book but uh, as, as you may know she was attacked by the American bishops, you know, a few years ago for a book called The Quest for the Living God. Um, she wrote a 42-page rebuttal, which was brilliant and magnificent, and of course, they couldn't reply to that. You know. uh, and by the way, you know, our own you know, bishops here were, you know, they weren't involved in that condemnation, by the way. So it was, it was a, the theologian at the time who was the advisor for the American bishops, you know, was behind that, and he was later fired. So, uh, so that didn't go anywhere, fortunately. Uh, but no, there hasn't been. Any, but, but I don't, I don't, I don't really think. My suspicion is that, that the, the powers that be won't, won't really want to, to argue with this. I mean, Joseph Ratzinger is quoted all over the place here. So, I mean, it's not. It's not that the, the theology that the theology is that um, is, is that controversial. It's just pointing out the defects of the past, you know, and recommending a path forward to the future. And I, I don't see this. I don't think it's going to be blowback on this, you know. Uh, but we'll see. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. It just has implications for so many things, like the death penalty. Of course. But also. Yes, that's right. I also read that, um, ironically, <clears throat> when the Indians in Guatemala were uh, being influenced by liberation theologian priests, General Rios Montt, when he became the, uh, the dictator, he married an evangelical, a Protestant American woman brought down evangelical missionaries to try to convert the Indians and teach them that their salvation and happiness was in the world to come, not now, and that they needed to submit to all the injustices. Well, that's exactly it was what... Such a distortion. Well, so it wasn't just the 16th century, then. It's the 20th century. Yes, yes. exactly. Yes. If one might, um, couldn't it be that trying to get any kind of meaning we get to Jesus, we just brought across this Of course, we'll never be able to fathom exactly what's behind any mystery, including the the, the grain of sand on the, on the on the path outside the door here. Uh, but to quote Anselm in a favorable light, "Fides querens and delectum," faith seeks understanding. That's the way we're built. So it's actually a laudable process to want to understand more more clearly and deeply, especially in function of our current of, of the culture, whatever it is at the time. Uh, to understand the better mystery better and to make it more assimilable and more challenging at the same time. All the while remembering, as you say, that fortunately for us and for reality itself, uh, the mystery is always beyond our grasp, which makes God so much more godlike. You know? <laughs> um, it makes us so much more humble. You know? All right, uh, thanks everybody. And uh, we'll meet here next week again for the second book two the second 30 pages or so of the book. But uh, I think this is especially, that first section is especially important. Thank you.